I want to thank this church for your faithful prayer, your monthly support, so many notes and letters and cards and texts that have been sent to me during my treatment. You've been absolutely wonderful. Love this place, love being here. And uh, I will say again, it'll embarrass him. Nobody has been more consistent in sending cards, notes, texts than that man right over there. It's been amazing. All he has to do, it, it really touches me. My doctor said that uh, 75% of the people in my situation will recover 80 to 90% of their voice. Now what you hear now is the best it's been. Last Wednesday I preached in Texas, preached Sunday through Wednesday, and it was more of a whisper. So I'm grateful for the progress. She also, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but I think the other 25% go on to become country singers. <laughs> Just in case I bought the boots, the belt, and the hat, I'm ready. <laughs> Open your Bibles to Mark 5, if you would please. Stand with me as we begin reading in verse 22. Now, one of my mottos as I get older is if you can't be good, be short. A lot of times I've been neither. And a whole lot of sermons I heard were not either one. So our goal today is to try to beat the Lutherans to lunch. <laughs> and behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, Come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed, and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered but rather grew worse. So you see, government health care is not new. <laughs> when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway, the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and thou sayest, who touched my clothes? Or who touched me? And he looked round about him to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him, and told him all the truth. Good idea. Tell Jesus the truth. We sometimes tell him how much we love him. But I read a verse one time said, if you love me, keep my commandments. I reckon that means don't tell him you love him if you don't tithe. Jesus said, you died, mint and anise and gum, these things ought you to have done. I was with a guy one time, an evangelist no longer in the ministry, and we were praying before a service. Now, he was a member of our church, he was very kind to me, and he always said, brother, I love you, you'll never know how much. And he was praying, and he said, Lord, we love you, you'll never know how much. I don't think that was true. I think God knows everything. That's a freebie, not part of the sermon. And he said unto her daughter, verse 34, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon 
as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, be not afraid, words we find out through the scripture. Say the next two words with me, please. Only believe. Let's try that again. Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him. Say Peter and James, John, this brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and seeth the tumult and them that wept and wailed greatly. In the holy lands, they hire people to serve as mourners at funerals and to serve as uh, rejoicers at weddings. I've seen both and they sound exactly the same. I can't imitate it well, but they're gonna go, ah, la, 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 That's who just at this place now. And he saw those that made the tumult and wept greatly. Verse 39, when he was coming to come in, he said unto them, why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he put them all out, he taketh the father and mother of the damsel and them that were with him and entered in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and he said unto her, Talitha Kumai, which is being interpreted damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of 12 years. And they were astonished with a great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it and commanded that something should be given her to eat. Lord, guide me and empower me. May I say everything, but only the things that you want said. You told us the devil and those fallen angels that serve him always come and try to snatch the seed of your word out of the soil of our hearts. Please keep them from that. And help us to determine to be good, receptive ground, eager to take in and allow a lodging place to take root and bear fruit in our lives. Anything you wish to give us today. If there are those who don't know that they have a home in heaven, I pray that you'd speak to their heart and they would know that before they leave today. Thank you for meeting with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, comes to the Lord Jesus with a request. It is a request of fervor. He besought him greatly. It was a big deal. It mattered. It was, at this point in Jairus' life, the most important thing in the entire world. It was a request of feeling my little daughter. Can anything surpass the tender, protective, caring love that a man or woman would have for their daughter. It was a request of faith. He said, she lieth at the point of death, but if you'd come, lay your hand on her, she'll recover and she'll live. He believed. He had heard what Jesus had done. He had no doubt. He went to Jesus, not a doctor, not a physician, just to Jesus, and he's a ruler of the synagogue. And uh, Jesus isn't real popular in most of the synagogues. Then there's a response. We see that Jesus is willing. The Bible says, and Jesus, verse 24, went with him. He's willing. Did you know that Jesus loves you? And he wants to help you. And he cares about you. Did you know God counts the hairs on your head? That's incredible. When I started losing my hair, I uh, tried a few things. I had no gain with Rogaine. I was preaching in Philadelphia. The preacher said, there's a guy here, works at a big hair transplanter. They just did the the big anchor on the evening news for Philadelphia, he'll fix you up for free. I went, there was 20 grand normally, and I got it 
for only 3,500. I said, I can buy a used car for 3,500 bucks. Uh, your doctor here, Dr. Chu, is offering me his card. Said he did hair transplants and plastic surgery in Beverly Hills. He said, next time you come out, come a little early, I'll fix you up. It'll take about a day. I said, Doc, I really appreciate that. But at my stage in life, I'd probably do better with the plastic surgery. <laughs> but never did I count my hairs. Didn't count the ones I kept. Didn't even count the ones I lost. God does. That's right. Every moment. He loves us. And the Lord Jesus, when that woman touches his body, touches his garment, stops. He's on his way to a little girl who's dying, but he stops. And he says, who touched me? The disciples are clueless, like a lot of us are sometimes. And they say, oh, come on, Lord. <laughs> These people all around you, they're all pressing against you. And you say, who touched me? Do you know you should never correct Jesus? Do you know Jesus knows what he's doing? Amen. Right now, in your life, in your situation. He looks at the woman. She comes, falls down, tells him the truth. And he says this, woman, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. You see, he wanted her to know she was not healed because she touched his garment. She was healed because of faith, because she believed. It's a very important doctrinal point. When you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, you come only by faith. You see, you may understand today that you as the rest of the world are all sinners and your sin gets you in terrible trouble with a perfect God. And nothing you can do can pay for your sin because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Get baptized, join a church, give away money, crawl on your knees to some holy place, do whatever you want to, be real good. But the wages of sin is death, none of those things. Ah, but the Bible says God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son the Lord Jesus Christ. And it tells us that Jesus, born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, all God, all man at the same time, went to the cross and died. The Bible says Christ died for us. Christ died for our sin. And the verse in John goes on to say, he sent his only begotten son, that if you believe in him, you'll not perish, not die and go to hell, but have everlasting life. Now, the Spirit of God may speak to your heart and tell you that today. You may walk down an aisle with others and you may have somebody talk to you and show you a little more thorough version of the gospel, explanation of the gospel, and, and you'll pray and ask Jesus to save you. But you won't be saved because you walk down an aisle. You won't be saved because you prayed a prayer. You'll be saved because you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, trusted Him and Him alone for your salvation real important truth. So Jesus is willing, but then he waits. And I think he waits a good little while. A lot of people, I imagine it taking time for the woman to wind her way through the crowd. And just then, some people come from Jairus' house with the most unbelievably thoughtless, cruel, unfeeling message. Look what they say. The Bible says, verse 35, while he had spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, certain which said, watch this, thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? See, Jairus had it figured out. Jesus would come to his house. 
he would put his hand on his daughter's forehead and she would get better. But that required her being alive. Do you know, sometimes we have it figured out. Here's how God's going to work. This money will come through. That pill will work. This new medicine will take effect. Uh, this counselor will help the situation. Uh, uh, my son or daughter will go to camp and they'll get straightened out. And we pray and we have faith and we believe. But you know what God often does? He allows things to go beyond anything we could have imagined. And to get so bad that we see no way they could ever improve. So I want you to notice a reassurance. There is first this callous message from the friends. Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? But Jesus says, as soon as he heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, be not afraid only believe. There is a comforting message from the Lord Jesus. And it is, don't be afraid. Fear is not from God. God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The psalmist said one time, I'm afraid I'll trust in thee. But he said again, I'll trust and never be afraid. You can be afraid if you want to, but you don't have to. Be not afraid only believe. Only. That word only is a strong word. It is saying this is all you need to do. This is all you need to be concerned about. This is all you need to focus on. This is all that is required of you right now. Only believe. You see, the Lord Jesus said to Jairus, you don't need new faith. You don't need different faith. You don't need more faith. What you need to do is continue to exercise the faith you already have. You came to me by faith. You came to me believing I could care for your daughter. Just keep on believing. Just keep on exercising that faith you have. I don't know what you're going through. I prayed with a brother who has stage four cancer. Mine was stage three after the first service. I don't know what you're going through. People are sometimes in terrible financial situation. Health issues that have far greater impact on their daily lives than mine has. Family situations so entangled, so messed up. It makes the royal family look normal. I don't know what your problem is, but I know what God says to you. Only believe. Don't need more faith. Don't need new faith. Don't need different faith. But you absolutely need to keep exercising the faith you have. My dad got saved first time he heard the gospel. Now, my dad's IQ was 149. 140 is genius. Dad was nine points above genius. I did not inherit that from him. <laughs> and the first time he heard the gospel, he said, that sounds like a good deal to me. It is a good deal. It's the best deal you'll ever see. You don't have to be as smart as my dad, but it'll be smart enough if you've never trusted Christ as your savior and aren't sure you have a home in heaven that you'll trust him today. Believe in him. My dad immediately began witnessing to his family. His father was Catholic. His mother was Methodist. Dad went to church maybe three, four times in his life. Found out his mother was saved. Gave his dad the gospel. And dad was polite, but my grandma, grandpa was polite, but not interested. Dad prayed for his dad for 17 years. Faithfully, witnessed to him again and again. But it was 
leading the Detroit Rescue Mission. I got a call from my Aunt Ruthie. Kenny, dad's sick, he's got emphysema. May live six days, may live six weeks. But if you want to see him again, you probably should come soon. That back to suitcase. Got in the car and drove all the way from Detroit, Michigan to Brimfield, Massachusetts that night. Went straight to the hospital. Gave my grandpa the gospel again. Said, Dad, something happened to me 17 years ago. I know it, son, you've been different. Won't you trust Christ? Let him forgive your sins. Take you to heaven when you die. My grandpa said, no. What do you do? Drove all night. Prayed all the way. Tell you what my dad did. He kept on believing. He said, Dad, why not? My grandpa said, all my life I've worked for everything I got. Raised six children through the Depression. Never went on the dole. Never took a dime from anybody. My dad was the, or raised seven children. My dad was the sixth of seven. Born in 1927. Now you can think whatever you want about this. Not sure I would have thought of it. My dad said, Dad, would you like to see my mother again? Oh, he said I would. She's a good woman. We had a lot of good years together. Dad said, you'll never see her again unless you'll trust Jesus as your Savior. See, my grandpa thought he just couldn't take a gift and get to heaven. He wanted to do something. But the Bible says, the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the only way you'll ever get to heaven is you accept the gift of eternal life through the death, burial, and resurrection, the shedding of the blood of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. My dad said, my grandpa said, all right, I will. He prayed, asked the Lord to save him. Just finishing the prayer, doctor came up, said to my dad, sir, I have to give your father a blood transfusion. Dad said, you go ahead, doctor. He just has been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. In the kind providence of God, my dad had a revival meeting scheduled a couple weeks later in a little town called Warren, right near Brimfield. If you're from New England, you'll know all these places are near Worcester. If you're not from New England, you'll think they're near Worcester. We all went. Now, I knew very little about my grandpa. He didn't interact a lot, nice man. Sat in an easy chair, smoked cigarettes, watched television until the test patterns came on. He'd had these two fingers cut off right about that knuckle in a saw accident. And I was just thrilled, excited, as a little boy to see him use this finger and this finger to pull a tissue out of the box. Thought it was impressive. <laughs> this time, my grandpa sat in the chair and he smoked cigarettes. But he didn't watch much TV. He read a giant print Bible, my dad got it. Too ill to leave the house, but every night we'd come back and he'd say, did anybody get saved tonight? Never asked that before. Just keep on believing. I heard a preacher tell the story one time about Robert Barry, uh, Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett. He said that they were both poets, that Elizabeth Barrett was bedridden, that Robert Browning read her poems, that he wanted to meet her and he went to see her. Preacher said, on Robert Browning's first visit, she sat up in bed. On his second visit, she got out of bed and walked. And on his third visit, they eloped. The power of love. Good story. If you hear a good story, don't look it up. Don't check it out. Just do what I do and say, I heard this story. I was in a used bookstore. And a Reader's Digest book of biographies. One of them was Elizabeth Barrett and Robert Browning. I bought it. I read it. He was a poet. She was a poet. She was bedridden. He read her poetry. He went to see her. And on his 47th or something like that visit, 
they eloped. Found another great story destroyed by the facts. And then I thought, wait a minute. That's a better story. Love doesn't say, one, two, three, run away with me. Love comes back 10, 15, 25, 35, 45, 47 times. Just keep on believing. Oliver Cromwell, a great leader in England, taking over after Catholics. He was a Protestant, had a lot of opposition. Very harsh in his rule, felt he had to be. Had so much, many people trying to kick him off the position he had. And Cromwell had a soldier who had committed what we would think was a minor infraction. But with Cromwell, it held the death penalty. Cromwell said, you'll be hanged when curfew rings tonight. The young soldier was engaged. His wife, not his wife, his fiance, came to Cromwell and pled for his life. And her appeal affected him. He wanted to help, but he thought of all that was at stake. And he said, I'm so sorry. If I don't keep this rule with your fiance, I won't be able to keep it with anybody else. I'll lose my authority. Your fiance will hang at the ringing of curfew. She kept on believing. She went to the bell tower. She climbed up to the top of that bell tower. She climbed out and at great risk, wrapped her body around the clapper in that large bell. The old deaf sexton came to ring the curfew and he pulled the rope and the bell swang like always, but he didn't know there was no sound. Her body took the blow of the clapper and the bell and muffled it so metal didn't strike metal. Cromwell came to see why curfew had not rung. She got down for the bell tower just about the time he got there. And they came towards each other. And the poet recorded the scene in these words. At his feet, she told her story showed her hands all bruised and torn and her young sweet face still haggard with the heartache uh, they did mourn. Touched his heart with sudden pity. Lit his eyes with misty light. Go, your lover lives, cried Cromwell. Curfew shall not ring tonight. Be not afraid. Say it. Only believe. One more time. Be not afraid. Only believe.